Hallelujah. Glory to God. It's good to be back home. I missed you guys. I do not know if you guys missed me too, but I did miss you guys. God is good. And all the time, he is good. And he's blessing us in every season. And uh, I remember a couple of years ago when for me to take off for a Sunday, it was impossible. But by the grace of God, God has brought people together. God has brought pastors and leaders together to make it a little easier for all of us and let God receive all the glory. Hallelujah. Glory to his name. It's a special day for me. It's a special day to have my mom over here. Like uh, Christy said, uh, they moved out of this area a few years ago. And, you know, sometimes we do not appreciate things that we have. We take them for a grant, right? We just assume that they will always be there. Aren't you the same? You just get used to life. You get used to your family. You get used to your parents. And you have this idea in the back of your mind that my mom, my dad, my family, they will always be around, right? Well, let me tell you, that's false. Because things change. And we are passing away. Glory to God, because we know where we are going. Amen? It's also special for me today because I can say proudly that I am a grandfather. Thanks to Mercy and Adi that uh, they have been obedient to the Lord and received in their family their first child. And it's my joy and it's my honor to be a grandfather and to rejoice with you all. May the Lord bless everyone, and especially today. May the Lord bless the little girl, Adelina Eunice Bocancia. Be blessed. Hallelujah. One day maybe she will watch this service. Because we do have the blessing to have everything recorded those days. Isn't that something? I wish I can view my bine cuvântare. I wish I can go back in time and, you know, next to the stories of my mom, I can see, you know, the past when I was brought to the altar to be blessed. But one thing that matters and one thing that's more important than anything else is that God is the one who blesses. And I feel blessed by God. Hallelujah. Glory to his name. Wow, the time goes so fast. And I have a long message for you tonight. The title of the message is A Family That Grows Together. A Family That Grows Together. You know, the parents are a blessing for the children, right? The parents are a blessing to the children. But also the children are a blessing to the parents. And even more than this, God is using one another. God is using the children to bless the parents. And he's using the parents to bless the children. Glory to God. Hallelujah. For we are all children of God. I am a child of God as much as my little granddaughter is a child of God. You know, we are one in Christ. Glory to his name. And God is using us all for the benefit of one another. Hallelujah. You know, when I watch the church coming together to 
worship, coming together to serve, coming together to be available for one another. I see the youth, I see the young people coming at prayers, being available, putting up and down the sound system. They all work and they all feel like they're doing a work for the Lord. And yes, they do. Glory to God. And you all are involved in doing something for the house of the Lord and for the ministry that God called you to be part of it, right? But here's the thing. While we think that we are doing the work of God, and while we are so excited to do the work of God, there's one thing that God cares more than anything else you are doing. God cares that you are serving the community. God cares if you are available to serve the church. But more than anything, God is interested in the person you are becoming. God is interested in the transformation that takes place in your heart, in your life, in your character. That's what matters to God more than anything else that we are doing. And both parents and children, we are, we are of value in the sight of God. And God is using one another to mold and to transform our characters into the image and likeness of God. Hallelujah. You know, in every ministry, any ministry that you're involved in, that's what God is after. That's what God is after. God is after the transformation and the change that he wants to take place in your life. Amen. Whatever you are doing in the church, if you serve in worship team, if you serve in media department, if you are just an usher, if you are anything that you are doing in this church, God wants to see that transformation taking place in your life. You know, if you're involved in Sunday school, you should ask yourself this question. Who am I becoming? Am I becoming more patient? Am I becoming more merciful? Am I becoming more kind? In anything that you do, who are you becoming? What's changing inside you? Because that's what God wants to see happening in anything that you do. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You know, not only in ministry, but this is a good principle for all of us to remember even in this life, especially young people. You know, a guy, a young man finishes high school or college and he goes to apply for a job. And what's one of the most important questions for them, the most important things for most people when they apply for a job? What would be a question? He comes home from uh, from the job interview and even his parents or siblings are asking him this question what is it how much right how much do you get paid how much do you get paid but this is not the right question this is not the right question this is the wrong question to ask the right question to ask is this who am I becoming? What am I becoming? What skills am I acquiring? What abilities am I developing? What knowledge do I get from the job? Who am I becoming? That's a very good principle for everyone to remember. Amen? Daniel, I know you take notes. Write this down. Why? Because once you acquire the skills, once you acquire the abilities, once you know and get the knowledge then you have control over the situation you have the boss running after you you have the company coming and begging you to work for them and they will give you offers you haven't dreamed of because you have just became so much valuable for the company it's the same in the kingdom of God it is very important to God the kind of person you are becoming. It's very important to God. May God help us understand this. So remember that the most thing and the most important thing in life is not how much you make, it's not who your friends are, it's none of those things, but it is the person you are becoming. Because once you are becoming that valuable person, you can have everything else. Glory to God. Hallelujah. This is a bonus point that I'm going to make right now. Young people who want to get married, don't focus on the person you want to marry. 
focus on yourself. Once you fix things in your own life, it's so much easier to find the person you want to marry. Here's something very important. Beauty, and I'm not talking about physical beauty necessarily. I'm talking about the beauty of your character. Beauty attracts beauty. Success attracts success. Righteousness attracts righteousness. Holiness attracts holiness. What you are, it is what you will attract. What's the lesson? Do you want to marry somebody who has a beautiful character? Then you got to start working on your own character. Do you want to marry somebody who is successful? Start practicing success even in your school, young people. It's a good place to start to practice success. What grades do you get? Even if you are middle school, maybe the kids are not here, but in college, what are your grades? You want to marry somebody who's successful and your grades are D or F or barely passing. You got to work on yourself. Amen. Do you want to marry somebody who is righteous? Do you want to marry somebody who is holy? Do you want to marry somebody who loves God? Then you better become that person. Because you will attract who you are. The person that shares the same values with you. Glory to God. Work on yourself and you will attract the person who values what you value. You know, everything in this world, everything in this world, everything of value in this world, it comes through a process. It comes through a process. You know, people don't just build airplanes out of chaos. Earlier today, I was talking to Alin, he's a Boeing engineer, and I asked him the question about that incident that happened with uh, Alaska Airlines, that door that just piled out in midair. Uh, things like this happen, right? But there is a process, it's a very delicate process for those airplanes to be built. You know, you don't see homes just coming out of nowhere. There is a process in building a house, right? A few years ago, I was building my home and I had a neighbor who liked to watch me working and he would come on his fence and he would put his elbows on the fence and he would just watch me for hours. He just enjoyed watching me work and, uh, you know, I started to talk to him and I got to know him and, and we talked about God at some point and he was an atheist and he said that, you know, everything just came into being out of nothing, chance and time, he said. And I looked at him and I said, Mr. Harry, how much time should I give my project? How much time and chance should I allow to my house to be built by itself? I said, it's pretty simple. It's two by fours, maybe some couple wires, maybe some plumbing pipes. How much time, how long do I have to wait for this house to come into being? And he looked at me. And he said, that's a good point. And then you tell me that the whole creation, everything that you see, everything that you don't see, just came into existence by time and chance? How foolish can that be? There is a process for everything that's been built or done. If you are building a company, if you are organizing a church, there is a process, a system in place. But the greatest project that builds, that beats all records, the most difficult project that was ever attempted, it was not the landing on the moon. It was not the invention of the computer. It was not any of the great things that humanity ever accomplished. It was not even the creation that God put together. The most complex, 
the most difficult, the greatest project ever accomplished in the creation is the creation of a being in the likeness and image of God. This is the greatest project. This is the most difficult project. This is what God is doing and working on to create that being that looks like him, that imitates him, that is in his likeness and his image. And my dear brother and sister, that's you, that's me, that's us. God said in Genesis chapter 1 verse 26, then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. My friend, if you did not know yet, let me tell you today, you are in the process. You are in the process of becoming a being according to the image and likeness of God. Glory to his name. Hallelujah. First John chapter 3 verse 2 says, Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when he appears, you, we shall be like him, because we shall see him as he is. We shall be like Christ. We are sons of God in the process of being glorified. Hallelujah. You are the pinnacle. You are the crown of God's creation. You are the greatest thing ever made. But you are still in the process of being finalized. God is not done with you. God is not done with us. He is still working. Hallelujah. There's more things to be changed. There's more things to be done in our lives. There's more things to be transformed in us. And God is working with you and with me for we are in this process hallelujah in this process God is using different tools in order to accomplish his plan and today we are celebrating a baby dedication and in my opinion the family is the tool of choice in God's toolbox that he likes to use in molding me and forming me and changing us into the image and likeness of Christ. There is no better setup, there is no better shop than the family where God is changing us. Like the Bible says, from glory to glory, one step at a time into the image and likeness of Christ. Hallelujah. You know, one reason the enemy is so much after the family is exactly because of this. The enemy understands the value of the family. The enemy understands that if he can destroy the family, he can take away the best tool that God, ha that God has in his toolbox. If you take away the family, everything falls apart. If you take away the family, there is no society, there is no church, there is no future. And the enemy knows this. Let's look at a few things that God is working and God is molding in us. And I'm going to focus on raising our children today. Amen. I am not going to exhaust this subject. This is a huge subject. But today I want to talk a little bit about what's being molded in us in this shop in this place called family you know the bible tells us that god is our protector amen are you with me are you here listening is god your protector yes he is my protector hallelujah psalm 27 verse 1 the lord is my light and my salvation whom shall i fear the lord is the stronghold of my life of whom shall i be afraid he is our protector now parents parents are becoming into the image of god when they themselves become the protectors of their children parents you are responsible you are called to protect your children Adian mercy the greatest mission that you have right now in this season is to protect that little girl because she depends on you 
protect them from danger. Children have limited ability and they do not know how to avoid the danger, right? They haven't been around long enough. They do not know it's not their fault. You, the parent, are supposed to be their protector. Protect them from what? Protect them from who? How about protect them from evil people? Is that a good thing? Are we smart enough, wise enough to protect our children from evil people? We got to be very wise. You know why? Because sometimes evil people are not easily identified. They do not come to you and say, here I am, I am bad. I am after your kids. I want to destroy them. I want to ruin them. No, they come dressed in sheep's clothing. And we have to be very wise to protect our kids. God counts on you to protect your kids from evil people. People that come dressed up in wolf clothing. There are plenty of predators in this world. Protect your kids. Be vigilant. Be wise. Be on your watch and protect your kids. We hear of so many stories of unexpected evil people just being shocked at what happens to many children whom, whose parents are not vigilant and are not watching. You know, protect them from their friends. Teach them how to choose their friends. Teach them how to, use their, how to choose their friends. Here's one thing. Having too many friends is not a good idea. Having too many friends is not a good idea. You know, when my girls were young, they would come to me every once in a while complaining. I say, Dad, I don't have too many friends. I only have one friend. And I said, that's enough. One friend. You have one friend. You know how much energy, how much resources, how much you have to give into that friendship. Consider it a blessing if you have not too many friends. Amen? Everybody is our brothers and sisters in Christ. But friends, you got to choose wisely. Amen? You know, too many friendships are hard to maintain. Consider it a blessing. And write this down. Consider it a blessing if you are not popular. It gives you the protection and the opportunity to stay focused on the right things. Friendships. And parents, you have to understand this. If your kids are too much into friendships, you know, it's very destructive. It's very time-consuming. It's very, very into their disadvantage. The season when they have to focus on school, the season when they have to focus on themselves to grow and to mature, they are consumed by relationships and friendships and sleepovers and so on and so forth may god give us wisdom amen protect them from from relatives from cousins you know i've heard so many stories of family trusting their relatives and they allow their children to sleep over to their family because they are cousins so easily to overlook the danger, so easily to have this false security because they are with family. You are responsible for your kids. All of you who are parents here, you are responsible for your kids. My advice to all parents is to adopt this no sleep over policy. Amen? No sleep over policy. I cannot count how many stories I heard of things that happened in families. When kids are unsupervised and they are together with their friends, their cousins, and so on. May God give us wisdom. Amen. We got to protect them from themselves. Children are ignorant. They depend on your protection. We have to protect them from themselves. You know... A four-year-old kid doesn't know that eating ice cream three, time, three times a day, it's bad for her or for him. You know, I know Adi and Mercy, they are doing a great job, you know, f you know, feeding that baby right now with breast milk. But, you know, you have to protect them from themselves. Why? Because they do not understand. 
And may God give us wisdom to do this. Kids do not. They do a lot of wrong things, and the parents are there to intervene for their own good. Now, here's the thing. This is very important. God is a teacher. The Bible talks about Jesus Christ being the teacher. People, when they talked about Jesus, they called him teacher. You know, parent, mom and dad, you better become a teacher. You know, if you say, I do not want to be ordained a deacon or a pastor or anything because I am not able to teach, guess what? If you are a parent, you better be able to teach. Because if you do not teach your kids, somebody else will. And they're not going to teach them what you want them to be taught. You better become a good te teacher. It is your responsibility. You know, don't panic. You are not in it alone. The Bible says us that the Holy Spirit is our helper. John chapter 14 verse 26. But the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things, including how to teach your children. May God help us. But the Bible says that the Holy Spirit will remind us of what we heard, what we read, something to note. You better know something. You better read the Bible. You better learn something so the Holy Spirit can remind you in the right time, in the right season, at the right situation. Did it happen to you that you're in a situation, you're not prepared for what you're supposed to, to, to answer to, but you know, right there when you needed it, the Holy Spirit reminded you of a word, a verse from the Bible, and you're able to come victorious. You got to read the Bible and invest in yourself and become a good teacher. You are the best teacher for your kids because next to the knowledge, you have what no one else has. What no one else has for your kids, you have the love of a parent. All the skills, all the abilities, all the wisdom of this world cannot compete with this. They cannot compete with you as a parent because you have this powerful tool. You have the love of a parent for a child. You have the advantage. Do not complain. Do not say, oh, this world is such a messed up world and it's such a hard thing to take care of kids in this world because you have the advantage. Not only that you have the Holy Spirit, not only that you have God on your side, not only that you have the church on your side, but you have the love for your child. You care for him or her. And nobody else has that in this world but you as a parent yourself. All the skills and the abilities that someone else might have cannot make up the difference, that, the advantage that you have in this process. Proverbs 22 verse 6, train up a child in the ways he should go. Even when he is old, he will not depart from it. Teach your children. Teach your children over and over again. Do not get tired. Do not get tired, but teach them. Listen to what the Bible says. Deuteronomy chapter 6. I'm going to go to verse 7. You shall teach them diligently to your children the commandments of the Lord you shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you are walking by the way and when you lie down and when you rise you shall bind them as signs on your hands and they shall be as faultless between your eyes don't get tired to constantly teach your children Apostle Paul understood this very well. And he says in Philippians chapter 3 verse 1, Finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you is no trouble to me. And it's safe for you. The apostle says, you know, I am repeating myself. I know I said this before, but I'm going to say it one more time. I'm going to say it again because it's so important. And it doesn't, it's not trouble to me. It's not difficult to me because it's so important to you. It's so important to your kids to teach them the laws of the Lord. To teach them to love God. To teach them to be obedient. To teach them the values that you have. Do not get tired of it. Do not grow weary. But teach them constantly. If you don't teach, 
your children somebody else will there is a multitude of people there is a multitude of people that are ready they are staying right there prepared to teach your kids the government wants to teach your children they want the government want to teach your kids you know not only the government but Hollywood Hollywood is ready to teach your kids all those stars they want to teach your kids the internet is right there available to teach them anything they want to but trust me it's not gonna be what you want them to be taught do not let somebody else teach your children amen prepare your kids for the future prepare your kids for the future psalm 127 verse 4 like errors in the hand of a warrior are the children of one's youth us the errors in the hands of a warrior you know one quality of an error is that you can reach targets much farther in time over years over decades you can reach targets far away from where you are but they have to be prepared amen when you when your errors reach the target they need to be in good shape to accomplish the purpose if you shoot an error to hit a target if that error is not sharp if that air is banned, if that air is not in good shape, it is not going to accomplish the purpose. You know, some people, instead of airs, they shoot out with umbrellas. The moment it goes off, it opens up and it doesn't go anywhere. It falls like down because there's no shape. There's no preparation. They are not ready. They drop to the ground because children, they need to be prepared. They need to be invested in. You need to sharpen your errors. You need to prepare your kids. You need to teach your kids. You need to be there for your kids. Do not turn them into umbrellas. Let them be sharp errors that when they are sent out, they go straight forward and hit the target and accomplish the purpose and the goal. Amen. Don't be overprotective of your children. Let them experience, teach them, and let them reap the rewards for what they do good, and let them have the consequences when they do wrong, so they can learn, amen? Prepare them for the spiritual future. You know, help them identify the calling of God for their lives, and help them flame fed into flame that calling. Like Paul tells Timothy in 2 Timothy verse 1, uh, chapter 1 verse 6 for this reason I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God to fan into flame the gift of God help your children be ready for ministry help your children be ready for the calling that you see that God placed in their hearts you know, there's such a big advantage to have a parent like my mom, to have a parent like one of your parents who saw in you the calling of God. And from a very young age, they encouraged you. They prepared you. They prayed for you. They prayed with you. They encouraged you to read the Bible. They encouraged you to go to a Bible school. They encouraged you to be ready for the future. Because today is the future from yesterday today is the future from five years ago and you know what your children one day they will arrive they will arrive five years from now 10 years from now 15 years from now the question is this well where will they arrive where will they arrive will they be prepared for that place where they will arrive in the future be wise and invest and prepare your kids for the calling of God and the gift of God to be manifest in their lives. You know, I see time goes fast. I'm just going to go really fast and I'm going to close because I do not want to hear from my son-in-law and my daughter. I kept them here too long. I hope the message is good enough for you guys so you won't complain. Prepare them for their future in their career. Amen. 
Some parents are doing a good job on this, but some are not. You know, because there is a season in life and kids don't understand. Before the service tonight, uh, one of the young ladies told me that she's in a season where she is very busy and she can't really get involved so much in ministry. And we have to understand those. As parents, we have to understand the seasons. Your children go to different seasons in life. There is a season to learn. There is a season to prepare. There is a season that you have to help them. You know why? Because as soon as a child hits resistance, as soon as a child gets into a, a wall that's hard to get through or pass over it, they are ready to back, back down. They are ready to give up. They are ready to pull back. You have to encourage them. You know what? You got to go to school. You got to study. You got to do your homework. It's important. It's the season for you to learn. It's the season for you to be educated, to study, to be prepared for the future. It's very important because everything we do, we do it for the glory of God. Amen. Colossians chapter 3, verse 23, 24. Whatever you do, do it with all your heart as unto the Lord. Hallelujah. You know, I added this point that I'm about to mention right now because I believe that in this day, it's more important than ever before. And it's about your kids' health. Parents, pay attention. This is very important. Young kids, pay attention. Youth, pay attention. This is very important. Because five years from now, you will surely arrive. But you might arrive to a place of sickness. You might arrive to a place that you do not want to be there. And that's because you plant the wrong seeds. You know, you got to watch what you eat. Amen? You got to stay away from drugs. Amen? You got to stay away from smoke. Amen? Why? Because those are bad for your health. You got to stay away from a sedentary lifestyle. This in itself can be a message. You see, I'm going really fast. You got to invest in your health. And parents, you need to teach your children. You know why? Because they do not know. They do not know. It's not their fault. If they drink five Red Bulls a day, it's bad. But they don't know any better. Somebody must tell them. Young people, pay attention. It's very important. The Bible is clear. You reap what you sow. Amen? And your health will affect your ministry. Your health will affect your career. Your health will affect everything in your life. You got to be wise about this. Amen? May God help us. I am going to close with this. Take responsibility for your children. It is your responsibility. You are in charge. It is your job to take care of your children. Do not trust anybody else to do your job for you. Don't even trust your friends. Don't trust the pastors. Don't trust the elders. It is your responsibility. Everybody else can help, but you are primarily responsible for your children. You know, a few years ago, when my kids were younger, I have a best friend who, at one point in our conversations, was a little disappointed with me because I told him that I do not trust him with my kids. And praise God that to this day we are best friends. He understood. He got it. And tonight I pray that you will understand also. And you get that your kids are your responsibility. Take charge of it. Be responsible. Take ownership of it. Amen. It is you who are primarily responsible for your children. Your family is your first ministry. Not only, not the only ministry, but definitely the most important one. Amen. If you fail in your family, all other ministries will suffer. If you fail in your family, 
all other ministries in your life will suffer. Take ownership of your family. Do not look for excuses. Do not say that the society doesn't help. Do not say that the church doesn't help. Do not say that your parents or your family doesn't help. It is your responsibility. Take charge of it, amen. Parents, don't blame one another. Very often you hear parents you know, blaming one another. You know, it's your fault that our sons or daughter turned this way. It's your fault. The wife says to the husband, the husband says to the wife, it's your fault. No, take responsibility for you are together responsible as parents for your kids, amen. And children, you know, most of them are in Sunday school, but you know, you are not off the hook because you can have the best parents. And if you do not do your part to be obedient, you got to be obedient. If you're a child, and some of you are still children over here, right? Even though you think you're adults, you still need to be obedient to your godly parents, amen, for this plan of God to take place in your life. Hallelujah. Let us come together as parents, as children, as families. Let us come together and work with God to accomplish and finalize this great and wonderful plan that God has for us. Amen. Second Corinthians chapter 3 verse 18. And we all with unveiled faces beholding the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. Hallelujah. Let's understand that together we will be more than victorious. Parents and children. For God to accomplish that miracle. That majestic plan that he has for you and for me. May God bless you. Amen.